Hi, I'm Dave Annell. Welcome to episode 19 of Setting the Record Straight. If you've watched episodes three and four, which focused on Meard Street in Westminster, you'll know that I like to use maps and other contemporary documents to help me to identify the actual buildings in which the subjects of my research lived. In this episode, I want to explore this idea a bit further and demonstrate a method that I use to trace addresses over hundreds of years and to show how it can work even when we don't have house numbers to help us. We're heading right back to 1797 and a land tax register for Mile End Old Town, part of the ancient parish of Stepney in the east end of London. This is the section covering Crombie's Row, a row of three-storey terraced houses built sometime in the 1790s. At the time the houses were built, they were completely surrounded by fields. This is the terraced row as recorded on Horwood's Map of London, published between 1792 and 1799. Note that it's called Doran's or Duran's Row here, and if we go back to the 1796 Land Tax Register, we can see that one of the occupiers was a man called Martin Duran. But our focus is on this man, John Oakley who appears in the land tax registers at Crombie's Row until 1806. Then from 1807, we find John's son, Francis Oakley, in the registers. Eventually, Crombie's Row became the established name of the row of terraced houses, and in 1820, we find Francis still listed in the land tax registers there. This is where the real work starts, because although we know that Francis was living in Crombie's Row, and we know where Crombie's Row was, we don't know which of the terraced houses was the Oakleys. It's clear from other records that Crombie's row was extended over the years at both ends, and although the houses are numbered on Forward's map and on Faden's 1819 revision, we just can't use the numbers to help us. What we can rely on is that the compilers of the land tax registers listed the properties in the same order each year, and it's this that allows us to work forward step by step and to track the occupants of each property over the years. The method I've used here is to list the names of the occupants of the two properties either side of the Oakley's house, and to keep doing the same thing with the land tax registers for every second year. I continue with this exercise up to 1832, the last year for which detailed land tax registers like this were compiled, and ended up with this. As you can see, the Howes are the only ones who are present throughout the period. The property occupied by the Oakleys was later occupied by what appears to be some businesses, while the other neighbouring properties show quite frequent changes of occupancy, but with enough instances of the same name appearing over two or three registers to convince us that we're definitely looking at the same properties listed in the same order. From 1841, we can of course use census returns to help us with this exercise. Although it's fair to say that the information from the 1841 census isn't as useful as it might be, as house numbers are infrequently recorded, and the double line divisions shown on the page denote separate households, not necessarily separate physical buildings. Nevertheless, we can see the names Howe, Household and Lerber in consecutive households here, and we can also add the names Harrington and Pierpoint, which tie in with details from later records. Trade directories are another useful source, and from the 1840s we start to get separate sections arranged by street. Of course, not everyone's going to be listed, but despite the occasional gap, we can still get some very useful information from them. The 1850 Post Office Directory of London provides us with the first reliable set of house numbers for Crombie's Row, and we've got enough here to enable us to line up the names of the occupiers with the previous lists of unnumbered houses and work out that the five houses we've been looking at became numbers 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23 Crombies Row. There's no one listed at number 21 in the 1850 directory, but the census for the following year finds William Slay and family living there. Note that William was a tobacconist. William Slay is also listed in the 1852 Post Office Directory, but in 1854 we find William Mocock, in 1857 John Pickett, and in 1860 Daniel Badlock, actually Daniel Badcock, and all of them were tobacconists. So even though the occupants are changing regularly, there's a consistency in the use of the premises which gives us confidence that we have the same property. I continued this process, adding names from censuses and trade directories right up to 1871, 
And this is what my document looked like then. We're still seeing very good evidence that we're dealing with the same properties and that we're maintaining a secure line of continuity. We can now be fully confident that number 21 Crombie's Row was the house formerly occupied by the Oakley family. And when we look at the directory for 1874, we find yet another tobacconist at number 21, George Edward Pullen. But this was a year when a huge change took place. The various terraces that made up Commercial Road East were incorporated in the main road and renumbered, with odd numbers on the north side of the road and even on the south side. The name Crombie's Row disappeared. But it's not hard for us to find the houses that formerly made up Crombie's Row in the 1875 Post Office Directory. George Edward Pullen, the tobacconist, is now listed at 349 Commercial Road East. When we add the details from 1874 and 1875 to our master document, we can see an exact match between the occupants of 19 to 23 Crombie's Row in 1874 and the occupants of 345 to 353 Commercial Road East in 1875. The former Oakley residence was now number 349 Commercial Road East. You'll have to trust me on this, but there has been no further renumbering of the houses in Commercial Road. And remarkably, despite the twin effects of the Blitz and post-war town planners and developers, the row of terraced houses is still there today, virtually intact. And if we go to Google Maps Street View, we can see number 349 as it is today. The two properties immediately to the east were apparently pulled down and a synagogue built in their place in 1921. But number 349 is still there, the very same building that John Oakley moved into in the 1790s. Of course, the area would be unrecognisable to the late 18th century inhabitants. But if we view the terrace from above, as it is today, the property boundaries are almost identical to the view that we got from the 1790s map. I hope you found this useful. If you've had any success doing something similar yourself, or if you have any suggestions for other sources that you might use, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I'll be back soon with another episode of Setting the Record Straight.